Please turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of 1 Timothy. The book of 1 Timothy is on page 991. If you're using the Bible underneath the seats, if you don't have a Bible, please do take advantage of that Bible. We would love for you to use it. And again, it's, the, it's there for you to have if you don't own a Bible. We would love for you to have a Bible of your own. Friends, this morning we uh, begin what I think will be a 15-week series in Paul's first letter to Timothy. And uh, perhaps you're wondering, why out of all the books of the Bible did you pick 1 Timothy? Some of you have asked me that. And so I just want to let you know kind of my process. What I do is I simply close my eyes and I open the Bible. Yes, there it was. No, no, obviously I'm kidding. Here at Redeeming Grace Church, friends, we want to have a regular diet of preaching from both the Old and the New Testaments. By God's grace, we want to preach the whole counsel of God. And so since we spent the last four weeks in the Old Testament and Jonah wanted us to study a New Testament book next. But I also, as we studied both the Old and the New Testament, want us to become familiar with the different genres or types of Scripture. And thus far, a lot of what I've preached over the last year and a half at Redeeming Grace has been historical narrative. Matthew, Genesis, Jonah, all filled with narrative. And to be honest, I love preaching the Bible's stories and history. Uh, but as I considered the next sermon series, I knew it would probably be helpful for us as a church to choose a non-narrative book. And so when you narrow that down in the New Testament, really the options are the epistles or the book of Revelation. And since tackling the apocalypse this early in my ministry seemed, well, apocalyptic, I decided to preach an epistle and eventually landed on 1 Timothy. I'm not sure that I've ever heard a sermon series on the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy doesn't pack the theological punch that some of Paul's letters do, like Romans or Galatians or Ephesians or Colossians. You'll not find in 1 Timothy the, the soaring theological arguments that Paul does in other places about predestination or justification by faith alone or the person of Christ. No, 1 Timothy is much more rubber meets the road. It's more nitty-gritty. It's relentlessly practical. And what is 1 Timothy relentlessly practical about? It's our life together as a church. If you flip over real quick to 1 Timothy 3, 14, and 15, Paul gives what I think amounts to the purpose statement for his letter. He says in 1 Timothy 3.14, I hope to come to you, Timothy, soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Friends, I wonder, have you ever given much thought about how you ought to behave within the church, how you ought to operate? Maybe you've taken it for granted. Well, Paul did not, apparently. And he didn't want Timothy and the congregation he pastored to take for granted their life together either. Before we get going this morning, let me give you a little bit of a, of a context, a little bit of a frame of reference for when and why Paul wrote this letter to Timothy. As best we can tell, Paul wrote 1 Timothy in the mid-60s AD, after the events recorded in the book of Acts. So if you try to fit 1 Timothy into the sequence of Acts, you're going to be frustrated, in other words. This happened after Acts. Acts ends with Paul in prison, but it appears that he was released and resumed his ministry for a few years before then being in prison again and beheaded in Rome in the late 60s. Uh, for one, what we can patch together from 1 Timothy, at some point after Paul regained his freedom, he traveled back to churches that he had planted, back to churches he knew. So he went back to the church at Ephesus, along with his ministry protege, Timothy, to visit the body there. This was a church, friends, that Paul dearly loved. He had planted the church of Ephesus several years early, earlier at the end of his second missionary journey, according to Acts 18. And then Paul, according to Acts 19, spent two to three years there helping to shepherd the church during his third missionary journey. Several years later, around A.D. 60, Paul wrote a, theo a theological treatise to this church from his Roman prison cell about the glorious riches that are ours in Christ Jesus and the implications of the gospel for our lives. We know this treatise as what? As the book of Ephesians. 
All that to say, Paul knows this church well, and he loves it deeply. And what Paul apparently found when he returned to this church with Timothy was a mess. From what we can tell, the church was beset by false teachers. It was, it was marked by disunity. It needed guidance on a host of matters from, from leadership to social responsibility. And so rather than stay in Ephesus himself, what Paul decided to do was to leave Timothy as his proxy there while Paul went on to minister in Macedonia. Timothy served as Paul's apostolic representative and pastored the church at Ephesus for a season in order to set the church in order. And that's why 1 Timothy, friends, along with 2 Timothy and Titus, is called one of the pastoral epistles. Paul wrote to Timothy to help him pastor, shepherd the church. Paul is caring for the health of this young pastor, but more than that, he's caring for the entire Ephesian church. And friends, because we understand the words of the Apostle Paul to be inspired by the Holy Spirit and, and backed by the authority of King Jesus, the truth of Paul's letter to Timothy echoes down through the ages to us today. We, like the church of, at Ephesus, learn from 1 Timothy how to live together in the gospel in the household of faith. So let's read together the opening of, of this letter, 1 Timothy 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient for the ungodly and sinners, for the holy, unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Friends, I think this, the structure of this opening uh, 1 Timothy is, is rather easy to see. Verses 1 to 2 contain Paul's greeting, his, his salutation to Timothy and to the entire church. And I've, I've summarized these verses in point one in the sermon, gospel blessings for a faithful ministry. Gospel blessings for a faithful ministry. And then in verses 3 to 11, Paul really wastes no time in helping Timothy address the urgency of of dealing with those who would teach a different doctrine than the one handed down by Christ and the apostles. I've summarized verses 3 to 11 with point 2 of the sermon, gospel urgency for a healthy church. Gospel blessings for a faithful ministry, gospel urgency for a faithful church. Here's the main idea. The main idea of these first 11 verses that I hope will be the main idea of the sermon. Friends, preserving doctrine that conforms to the gospel is vital to the life of our church. Preserving doctrine that conforms to the gospel is vital to the life of our church. And brothers and sisters, I pray this morning that Paul's words of exhortation might instruct us, that they might encourage us, and even implicitly warn us today. False doctrine and foolish topics will kill a church. They'll destroy individual lives. And so we must be vigilant to protect gospel doctrine so that we might grow in love to the glory of God. Let's look at this first point, gospel blessings for a faithful ministry. Paul begins his letter to Timothy in the way that he begins his other letters. He states who he is and to whom he's writing, as he frequently does, and then he includes a, a word of gospel blessing to them at the end. Some have questioned why Paul was this 
formal. If he and Timothy had this close father-son relationship, then why the stately intro? Why, I think the answer to that question is pretty simple. Yes, Paul wrote to Timothy, his son in the faith, but he wrote to Timothy as a means of communicating with the entire Ephesian church as a whole. In fact, flip over real quick to the very end of the letter. The very end of the letter, 1 Corinthians 6, the last sentence. Paul writes, grace be with you. Now that sounds a lot like the opening of the letter, doesn't it? But the you at the end of 1 Timothy isn't singular like it is at the beginning. In the Greek, it's in the second person plural. He says, grace be with you all. He has the entire church in mind. It's not hard to imagine Timothy taking Paul's letter and reading it to the other elders to fortify their resolve too against the false teachers. Perhaps he read to the entire church, the intensely practical sections about prayer and unity and elders and deacons and widows and budgets and money and all the rest. We don't know. But what's clear that Paul has the entire church in mind, even as he writes to Timothy. The outline of Paul's greeting is clear. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my true child in the faith. I think it's safe to say that Few, if any, were closer to Paul's heart than Timothy. He had raised him in the Lord. He had mentored him in ministry over many years. And so he cared deeply about the success of Timothy's ministry. But but Paul's greeting does more than express relationship. It expresses authority. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope. Paul often begins a letter in a similar way. It's not because he's on a, some sort of a power trip. Rather, he's reminding the recipients where his authority comes from. He's an apostle of Christ Jesus. Paul understands himself on a level with the 12 that followed Jesus in his earthly ministry and that after his ascension represented Jesus' teaching authority in a unique way. Paul bore all the marks of a true apostle. He had seen the resurrected Jesus on the road to Damascus. He had been chosen and commissioned by God to to play a unique role in the spread of the gospel to the Gentiles. Friends, apostle simply means sent one. But Paul wasn't merely a sent one of the churches like we might think of a modern day missionary. Paul was a sent one by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. His apostleship was grounded in the will and command of both the Father and the Son. So friends, why why should Timothy and the church at Ephesus and Redeeming Grace Church listen to and obey what Paul has to say? Because he's a, an apostle by the command of God. It's an, this, is, this is no ordinary letter that you or I might write. This is an apostolic missive bearing the authoritative seal of King Jesus. Notice how Paul frames it. He's an apostle by command of God our Savior and Christ Jesus our hope. Now that is a unique way to phrase it, isn't it? Why did he do that? Well, I think what he's doing is he's he's positioning his ministry as an apostle in the context of salvation history. Labeling the Father as God our Savior points to God's saving activity in sending Christ the Son. How else is God Savior but through the the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection and ascension of Jesus? And this Jesus is indeed now risen from the dead and ascended to the right hand of the Father and He will come again, won't He, to judge the living and the dead. Christ Jesus, this victorious King, is our hope. One glorious day, Jesus is going to bring down the curtain of God's redemption. Heaven will descend to earth and all of us will forever be with the Lord if we're His. But until that great day comes, the gospel of Jesus, the apostolic preaching of the gospel will be spread across the earth and advance God's reign through the establishing of local churches just like ours. So in this greeting, Paul, is what, he, what is he doing? He's reiterating his relationship with Timothy. He's speaking of his authority to speak on behalf of Jesus. He's given the context 
of his ministry, God's saving work. And finally, he invokes gospel blessings, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, these are not just well wishes from Paul. They're not the equivalent of our you know, best wishes. Cheers. God bless you, even. When we say those things, we're communicating future hopes. Paul, on the other hand, is reminding these believers of current realities. Grace, mercy, and peace are theirs, flowing from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. Again, Paul places Christ Jesus, the Messiah King, alongside God the Father as the source of these blessings. There's no question in Paul's mind that Jesus is one with the Father in the glory of His person. Father, Son, and Spirit operate together in the great work of redemption. How could Paul be so confident? How could he write this over and over again that grace, mercy, and peace are ours? Well, God the Father sent Christ Jesus our Lord who purchased these blessings on the cross and has applied them to our hearts by His Spirit. Oh, friends, don't let these blessings run by unnoticed across the page. They're terms that are they're so familiar to us in our Christian lingo, aren't they? Grace and peace. In this case, grace, mercy, and peace. Grace is God's kindness to guilty and undeserving sinners like us. Mercy is similar to grace, but the accent is a bit more on God's pity to us since we have no way to save ourselves. And peace is our status of reconciliation to God as those who were previously alienated from Him and from one another. Christ Jesus has made peace, Paul writes, through the blood of His cross. Friends, think how encouraging this must have been for a young pastor like Timothy. Timothy may face a mountain of pastoral challenges ahead of him, but he's a minister of the gospel that has made him a recipient of God's unmatched grace, his stunning mercy, and his life-giving peace. Earlier this week, I was a, a bit discouraged about a certain situation, and, and Lindsay texted me a note of encouragement. And guess what? She didn't say Oh, don't worry, babe, it'll get better. That's true, but that's not what she said. She didn't say, oh, you're doing a great job. I don't know if that's true, but that's not what she said. <laughs> Rather, she didn't remind me of anything about me. She texted me a portion of Ephesians to remind me of what I have in Christ Jesus. Beloved, this is what we all need. How will we face the challenges ahead? How will we make it faithful to the end? Oh, we need a deeper knowledge and a fuller experience of the treasure trove of blessings that are already ours due to our union with Christ. We need to go deeper into the gospel. This is what binds us together as a church, friends. We share in the blessings won by Christ Jesus. Beloved, if you're a Christian this morning, these words are just as much for you as they are for the church at Ephesus. Grace is yours today. Kindness that you have not earned nor deserved is yours full and free this morning if you're in Christ. Whether or not you felt like coming to church today, whether your affections are cold or warm, grace is yours in Christ. Mercy is yours today too, friends. The Father's compassion is extended toward you this morning. Even if you've sinned royally this week, mercy abounds in Christ Jesus our Lord. His work is the basis for your forgiveness, not your own. Peace is yours this morning. Perhaps you feel as if God is working against you in your life's circumstances. Nothing in your life is going according to your plan. Well, the gospel assures us that in fact, God is for us. No longer does He count us His enemies, but in Christ as His sons and daughters. We're children of the Father and brothers and sisters in the family of God. We've been reconciled and restored and forgiven. Praise God from whom all blessings 
blow. Friends, this is the context of a faithful ministry. All that we're going to look at in the rest of 1 Timothy and how to live together as a church is for this purpose. So that we might go deeper together in the grace, mercy, and peace of our God. We'll spend the majority of our time in the next few verses and in the second point of the sermon, lest you think I'm about to wrap up. (laughs) Number two, gospel urgency for a healthy church. You know, as the Russian invasion of Ukraine began, President Zelensky warned his people about undercover Russian saboteurs in the city of Kiev who would wreak havoc ahead of the invading troops. You know, in a similar way, threats to a local church often rise from within. Today, there are a lot of Christians sounding alarm bells about the incursion of the world upon the church. And and no doubt, no doubt, we need to be mindful of the ways that the culture is shaping us. But for most local churches, friends, the most potent threats are not from the outside, but from the inside. Threats that sabotage a church from the inside out. And in fact, this is exactly what the Apostle Paul had warned the elders of the church at Ephesus about years before. Listen to what he told these elders of the church at Ephesus in Acts 20, 29. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert. Paul's words were prophetic. That's exactly what happened, and that is exactly why he left Timothy in Ephesus years later. He writes in verse 3, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Again, we don't know the exact situation, but perhaps Timothy was faltering in in his resolve. Maybe his youth was showing. Perhaps those certain persons Paul mentioned were draining the lifeblood from Timothy's ministry. Maybe he wanted to move on and leave the mess to the Ephesian elders. We don't know the entire scenario, but apparently the issue was serious enough that Paul felt the need to throw his apostolic weight behind the issue. Remain at Ephesus, Timothy. Don't give up. Paul's reminding us that the the presence of problems in a church don't necessarily mean that we need a change of scenery. Here's the thing, friends. Every church has problems. Did you realize that? Every church has problems because every church has sinners. You'll not find a perfect church until God gathers the assembly of the redeemed in glory. Often what we think is greener grass on the other side of the local church fence turns out to be a mirage created by our own discontent hearts. It may be easier to leave, but often what we need to do is stay and be committed to work toward the health of the church. At risk of embarrassing these folks, aren't you glad for a faithful member and elder like Steve Bohr? Aren't you thankful? For 20 years, he's labored for the health of Redeeming Grace Church. Aren't you thankful for longtime members like Rich and Elaine Moreno who've who've stayed in the boat through both calm and choppy waters? It's probably not fair to only name these three folks because many of you have done this. They've just been here the longest, I think. May the Lord give us all this type of God-centered perspective. You know, there are obviously good and right reasons to leave a church. Sometimes life and work dictate a move. Uh, Maybe the Lord would even stir in some of your hearts to go to the mission field uh, or to join a, a church planting or a church revitalization effort elsewhere. I hope all of us will hold our lives with an open hand for the gospel's sake. But beloved, I hope there are many of you who will be committed to the long term good of Redeeming Grace Church, to this embassy of Christ's kingdom. Saints that work to see our church family firmly established for generations to come for the sake of Christ's fame in the Southwest Valley. Beloved, it ought not to be a trivial 
or flippant reason that causes us to take our hands off the gospel plow here. Our culture values the fast and trendy, doesn't it? But that's not how the Lord often works. We ought to cultivate in our hearts a love for the long game for the patient and unglamorous work of laboring in the harvest fields for the good of the church and the glory of Christ's name. What Timothy needed to do was stay. The life and health and gospel witness of the church at Ephesus depended on it. Why was he to stay? He was to charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine nor to devote themselves to myths. Fun job, Timothy. It's a tad frustrating because Paul rarely comes out in his letters and tells us exactly what the false teachers were teaching. Uh, His concern is rather how the church, or in this case, Timothy, should respond to the false teaching. But I think there are enough breadcrumbs that lead us on the right trail. Uh, What the false teachers were doing were, were using the Old Testament for a purpose that God did not design it for, especially in this age since the coming of Christ. In verses Uh, In verse 7 and and, and onward, Paul says that that these false teachers fancied themselves Old Testament experts, but they really had no idea what they were talking about. And then in verses 8 to 11, Paul demonstrates the right and proper use of the law in contrast to their teaching. Another clue is what Paul wrote later in this letter in chapter 4. Paul says that these false teachers advocated a legalistic asceticism. They forbade marriage. They required abstinence from certain types of food that God created to be received with thanksgiving. It seems like they were using the Old Testament law to require things of New Testament believers that were out of step with the gospel. Maybe they were adding restrictions to the law similar to the Pharisees of Jesus' day. And Paul in verse 3 says what they were teaching was a different doctrine. Which implies what? that already in the first century A.D., some 40 years after the ascension of Jesus, there was already a standard body of doctrine in place to which the teaching of the church should conform. And what might that standard body of doctrine be? Well, look over at chapter 6, verse 3. I know I'm having you flip a lot in 1 Timothy. Hope it helps. Here's the clue. 1 Timothy 6, 3. If anyone teaches a different doctrine, and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he's puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. So friends, the the agreed upon standard by which all teaching could be tested and judged was the teaching of Christ and his apostles. Paul's going to come back to this concept again and again in this letter. Sometimes Paul will call this, this standard body of doctrine the faith or the truth, or at the end of our passage today, sound doctrine, or teaching, or even the good deposit. Each time he's referring to the apostolic gospel handed down through Christ Jesus our Lord, the gospel doctrines once for all delivered to the saints. To deviate, to swerve from this standard of teaching is to put the church in danger of preaching a different gospel altogether. And that's what the false teachers were doing. They were, they were pushing the church toward the cliff's edge. But the cocktail of these teachers' error, it was bad theology mixed with foolishness. In their poor use of the Old Testament, these men devoted themselves to what Paul calls myths and endless genealogies. Myths, friends, are just literally what they sound like. Fables that aren't in the Bible, made up stories. And what about endless genealogies? Well, it seems that the teachers were creating these exotic tales from the genealogies of the Old Testament. And likely the genealogies in the book of Genesis, since they fancied themselves to be an expert in the law and the Torah. And why was this so harmful? Because of instead of promoting the stewardship of God that is by faith, Paul says, What is that? What is the stewardship from God by faith? That's God's plan of salvation revealed through the ages. Instead of promoting that, 
the myths and geological tales, genealogical tales, <laughs> only promoted speculation. It was all conjecture. It was pointless and it was fruitless. It caused division in the church as people took sides about whether or not they believed the fables to be true. Beloved, guard your hearts and your minds from such pursuits. Maybe for some of you, your temptation in this area is that you're just enamored with biblical prophecy about the end times. I don't know that to be true of any of you, so I'm not sub-preaching here. But maybe that's you. Maybe you spend your days trying to figure out all the details of the end times and what Gog and Magog are and where's America's place in prophecy. Well, friends, I'd submit to you that if you spend any significant time on what falls in line with what I just described, that will promote in your heart only speculation. Content that only is conjecture rather than promoting truth through love. For others, maybe it's not so much an interpretation of the Bible, but maybe for you, this, the temptation in this area is what's going on in our world. Maybe you spend your days investigating what's really going on behind the scenes about COVID or politics or even foreign affairs. Listen, in a world where distrust of media and government abound, sometimes legitimately, it can be tempting as Christians to give ourselves to such theories. But beloved, as believers, we need to remember that we are people of the book. We're, we're a people called to set our minds on what we know to be true. It's fine to have opinions about vaccines and elections and all the rest, but we ought to give our highest energies and loudest voice to what the Bible says is urgent and clear, the true gospel. So, beloved, don't follow the clickbait. Don't feel like you have to go down the rabbit hole of every YouTube video and Reddit thread about these different things. Don't devote yourself to what is speculative. Devote yourself to knowing sound doctrine and to living in love. Did you know that we as a church actually have a body of doctrine that we've planted in the ground as the standard of our unity together? and the, the guardrails of the teaching ministry here at Redeeming Grace Church, we have that. It's our statement of faith. Friends, our, our statement of faith isn't just a, a marketing tool for our website. <laughs> That's really not what it's for at all. It's helpful, I guess, for that. But friends, the, this, our statement of faith does two key things spiritually among us here. It promotes unity, and it protects the church. Our statement of faith promotes unity because it includes the common gospel and church doctrines that we all agree upon. And it protects the church so that, if God forbid, there's ever false teaching, the congregation can hold the teacher accountable to the written standard in accordance with the truth. And by the way, friends, you ought to do that. You ought to do that. If I or another teacher at Redeeming Grace Church ever teaches doctrines outside the boundaries of, the, of our statement of faith, outside the lines of biblical orthodoxy, you ought to warn me. And if I persist, you ought to remove me. But I hope in general, friends, you'll lean in the direction of trusting the elders of Redeeming Grace Church in this way. Because part of what it means to in, install godly elders, to install men that, that, that God has gifted to the church is to install men with good theological instincts. It's to install men with a deep commitment to the Bible. We're not perfect in any way. We can make mistakes, certainly. But installing godly elders install, it means installing men committed to teaching within the boundaries of the statement of faith. Did you know that there are some biblical doctrines that, while important, simply are not as urgent for the protection of the gospel and the building up of the church? Did you realize that? All doctrine is important, but not all doctrine is equally urgent. So you won't find any of, of the types of doctrine in the statement of faith that believers can agree to disagree on without compromising what it means to preach the true gospel and build up the true church. In fact, the less urgent a doctrine for the preservation of the gospel and the building of the church, the lower the heat and intensity of our hearts should be about it. 
Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Our statement of faith doesn't say anything about whether the so-called charismatic gifts of the Spirit have ceased after the apostolic era or whether they continue now to today. Now, I, I guarantee you the elders have opinions about such things. And the fact that we don't pursue in our, in our gatherings, we don't pursue tongue speaking and prophecy and healings ought to tell you something, right? But there's no verse in the New Testament that definitively indicates one way or the other about the charismatic gifts. And so rather than give our energies in a dogmatism about doctrines in which the spirit is le- the scripture is less dogmatic, we're going to plant our flag in the doctrines essential to salvation and the doctrines essential to what it means to be a church. Because here's the thing. Look at what Paul tells Timothy is the end goal of it all. The aim of our charge, verse 5, is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Apparently, a stern pastoral warning was not incompatible with love. Why ought Timothy to confront the false teachers? Because their speculation and myths had the opposite effect in the body. It produced vain discussions and never-ending controversy within the church. The false teachers took the church down the trail of worthless debates, of theological minutia, all the while oblivious to the damage it was doing within the body. Brothers and sisters, we ought to be zealous for truth. But we ought to be equally zealous for love. Our primary Christian duties are to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. This love that Paul commends, that is the end goal of all of our teaching, it's not fluffy, it's not flimsy, it's deeply rooted. It's love grounded in the truth. Friends, after all, how do we love God but to know Him? And how do we know Him unless we know the truth that He's revealed about Himself? Similarly, with our love for others, how do we love others unless within the parameters and by the means that God has revealed to us in His Word? How do we love each other well unless our heart is being constantly informed and transformed by the gospel so that we imitate this mercy of God to others? Brothers and sisters, we ought not to be zealous for truth here at RGC so that we can can market ourselves as the church that stands without apology. That is not why we do that. We don't stand on the truth so that our brains can be filled with knowledge. We ought to be zealous for the right preaching and teaching of the gospel so that our church grows together in biblical love. Paul says, Paul says it's love that issues from a, from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. In other words, friends, it's love that stems or springs from a life transformed by the gospel of Jesus. Love that, that issues from the new birth. That's the goal of our ministry. That's why guarding the gospel is so urgently important. So kids, ministry workers... RGC Kids Workers, guess what your goal is as you teach discipleship class, as you teach the gospel project, as you assist, not just that our kids might learn, but that they might love, that they might love Jesus and others. Parents, this is our goal, isn't it? It's not just that we parent our children to we want them to grow up and be good citizens and succeed in life, although that's, that's important. We want to give them life skills. But we want to shepherd their hearts toward a love for Christ and His people, praying that the Spirit gives them a repentant and faith-filled heart to do so. House-to-house leaders, fellow elders, this is the goal of your ministry and the lives of your members. It's an increasing affection for the Savior and for others. It's really very simple, isn't it? Notice what Paul tells Timothy in verse 6. Certain persons having swerved from these, that is, from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith, 
have wandered into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. So the, these persons in the church that were pursuing their own agendas and imaginations, they were careening away from the gospel that offers them a transformed life. They swerved from the, the pure heart and the good conscience and the sincere faith. Friends, this description of these men in the church ought to warn us. Because what I, what I think we see here in these false teachers is not an anomaly, historically. In fact, I would hazard a guess that if we were to catalog all the professing Christians over the years that we know who have walked away from the faith or fallen into unrepentant sin, we could probably slot them into these two categories that Paul talks about in verse 6. Paul says these are true of these church members in Ephesus. They wandered away from biblical love, and they walked away from biblical truth. They walked away from love, and they walked away from truth. These people, Paul says in verse 6, wandered away into vain, empty discussion. <laughs> it was fruitless, it was empty, it was irresponsibly divisive. They were willing to take the church in a direction that was loveless. They stopped caring about building up the church. Friends, don't let that be you. But then in their pride, they also ceased to care about truth. Ironically, they desired to be teachers of the law, but they didn't know what they were talking about. They made confident assertions while being unskilled in the Scripture. It proves the, the point all too well, friends, that it, it is possible to be at the same time confident yet incompetent. We can trick ourselves into thinking that we're an authority on something that we're really a novice in. Usually the last ones to realize that their confident assertions are incompetent assertions are the persons making the assertions. That's why it's so important to cultivate in our hearts the theological humility that we talked about last week in Jonah 4. So that when an elder or a godly friend in the church says, brother, sister, I don't think you're understanding this correctly. I don't think that means what you think it means. I don't know that you're con considering the totality of how the Bible nuances this issue that you have ears to hear and a teachable heart. Beloved, we need to guard the truth, but we also need to guard our love. We need to work to preach the true gospel and sound doctrine, but only to the end that love for God and love for others flourishes like a growing plant in this place. Make both truth and love the pursuit of your life. The false teachers, well, they thought they were an authority on the Old Testament law. But really what they taught was a different doctrine than the one laid down by Christ and the apostles. I never love it when the most hairy part of a text is at the end of the sermon. But that's the case here. So buckle up. Here's how we're going to close. In verses 8 to 11, Paul says that the false teachers used the Old Testament law in a way that God did not intend, out of step with the gospel of Christ. You can see that so clearly at the end of verse 10 and into verse 11. In, in Paul's mind, friends, the, the gospel, the saving message of God's salvation in Christ is the plumb line. That's a construction image. It's the, it's the plumb line by which we measure what a godly life looks like because the sound doctrine that flows out of the gospel teaches us how to honor Jesus with our lives. These verses in verses 8 to 11 are, are notoriously tricky to interpret. What does Paul mean when he says that the law is good? when he seems to indicate otherwise in Romans. What does he mean that the law isn't for the just? Is he talking about the just, the righteous as believers or as self-righteous? It's, it's a tough passage. Here's what I think Paul's doing. Even though the false teachers were inaccurate in their teaching of the Old Testament law, Paul says fundamentally the problem is not the law itself, but the way that they were using the law. They were using it unlawfully. See that? The law is good if you use it lawfully. It's a little play on words. If you interpret and apply it in a way that God intends, it is, it is good within the scope of its appropriate use. 
So what is the appropriate use of the law? He writes in verse 9, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient. In this context, I believe the just, the righteous, are Christian believers who through their genuine conversion produce the self-giving love that fulfills the law. It's, it's the, friends, as we know, it's the spirit, not the law, that produces a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith that Paul's already talked about. For us believers, the law as a written moral code is obsolete. It's obsolete. Jesus fulfilled God's law. And now we are under the gracious law of Christ. And certainly the law of Jesus includes moral imperatives that we must obey that are even similar to the, to the Ten Commandments. But friends, we do so with hearts transformed by the Spirit. The Old Testament law had no ability to do that. So to help us understand this point, Paul sets out this list of vices in verses 9 and 10. He says the law, rather, is for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else, grab bag, is contrary to sound doctrine. It's this graphic portrait of godless human activity that's precisely the opposite of what the Spirit produces in us in the gospel. The main way that the law is for those who are in this list is that the law reveals the depravity and wickedness of their hearts. If the false teachers truly understood the law, they would have realized that the law uncovers a depth of evil in human beings, but it plays no such role in conquering that evil. Starting at the end of verse 9, Paul starts ticking off human sins that correspond actually to the second half of the Decalogue, the second half of the Ten Commandments. Those who strike their fathers and mothers break the Fifth Commandment, honor your father and mother. Those who murder break the Sixth Commandment, you shall not murder. The sexually immoral and men who practice homosexuality break the Seventh Commandment, you shall not commit adultery, which is a command that enjoins us to sexual purity in mind and deed according to God's design. Enslavers or man-stealers are the most heinous violators of the Eighth Commandment. You shall not steal. Liars and perjurers break the Ninth Commandment. You shall not bear false witness. Friends, even in a casual reading of these violations, none of us stands innocent. We've all broken all of these commandments in different ways. We may or may not have hit our parents, but we've all been disrespectful and disobedient to them. We may or may not have murdered. I don't think any of you have. But each one of us have harbored hatred in our hearts toward another human being. We may or may not have practiced homosexuality, but which one of us is sexually innocent of lust or pornography or a whole host of other sexual sins? We may or may not have kidnapped another human. Again, I don't know that any of you have, but there's no doubt that each one of us has taken something that didn't belong to us as our own. No doubt we have all lied, broken our word, deceived others. Left to ourselves, we are lawless. These teachers seem to teach God's law as the source of life. But Paul says, all the law does, friends, is just reveal this cascading avalanche of evil that flows out of our hearts. And exposing us and laying us bare, the law drives us to the Lord Jesus. It steers us toward the only one who kept God's law perfectly. The one who died to pay the penalty of our law breaking so that he might justify us through faith in him. Friends, this is our only hope. Not that we can keep God's law, but that Jesus kept it for us and died to bear our curse. Friends, if you're not a Christian today, if you're not a Christian, realize that Christianity is not, is not a religion of rule keeping in order to earn God's favor and attention. Rather, it's a religion of relationship with the triune God by faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. Having broken faith with your Creator, 
and broken his holy law, you deserve God's just wrath. You deserve to be condemned for all eternity. But God in love sent his son to be our savior, to live, die, and rise again in our place. So that if you trust, friend, this risen king, if you rely on him, if you follow him as your Lord, you will be reconciled to God and live with him forever. It may be that by mishandling the law and teaching it incorrectly, the, the false teachers are encouraging the very type of sins that the law condemns. In any case, it's certain that their teaching and their lives are included in Paul's grab bag, catch all phrase. Whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. Paul's concern here at the end of our passage isn't just to show us how the law drives us to Christ and the gospel but to show us that the gospel message and the sound doctrine that flows out of the gospel compels a life of holiness. The lawlessness that the law exposes is contrary, he writes, to, to the sound doctrine in accordance, in, in line with, in conformity to the gospel of the glory of the blessed God, the happy God with which I have been entrusted, Paul writes. Beloved, we likewise have been entrusted with the gospel with which Paul was entrusted by King Jesus. We as a local church are charged likewise to guard this treasure. Remember the main point. We've covered a lot of ground today. Remember the main idea. Preserving doctrine that conforms to the gospel is vital to the life of our church. It's vital because by preserving sound doctrine, friends, we promote love. And by promoting love, we pursue the end for which God created us, to worship and enjoy Him forever. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we pray that you would take your truth and plant it deep in us, that you would shape and fashion us in your likeness, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.